Oh, perfect. Wonderful. Oh, yes. And I'll try to put this black thing for you somewhere else. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, maybe I can introduce you first. Okay, sure. Uh, so welcome everyone to the Foundations of Data Science virtual talk series at Tripod and the Distinguished Lecture Series at UMass Department of Mathematics and Statistics. So our speaker today, Professor Ingrid Dobrishi of Duke University, is a world-renowned mathematician who needs no introduction. Uh, Professor Dobrishi is the James B. Duke Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Electrical and Computer Engineering at, uh, at Duke University. Uh, before that, she was the uh, first female full professor of mathematics at Princeton. Uh, her groundbreaking research in time frequency analysis, in particular wavelets, as well as applications to signal analysis, signal compression, uh, computer graphics, and data science has garnered her numerous awards, such as MacArthur Fellowship, National, Ac National Academy of Science Award in Mathematics, Nemus Prize, Steele Prize, to name a few. Uh, Ingrid is a member of the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, Fellow of American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, Fellow of Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and Fellow of American Mathematics Society. Uh, Ingrid is also a strong supporter of women in science and a part of the 2019 class of uh, fellows of the Association for Women in Mathematics. Well, I can keep going on and on, but I would hate for everyone to stay here till midnight. So I just want to say at the end that it was also extremely lucky of me to have worked with Ingrid as a postdoc. And I can speak from my personal experience that Ingrid is the most brilliant, compassionate, kindest, and all in all the nice, nicest person one can ever meet. So without further ado, we are extremely excited to have Ingrid here to talk about discovering low dimensional manifolds in high dimensional data sets. Thank you, Ingrid. Well, thank you, Wei. I mean, that was, uh, I have to swallow a bit after that introduction. <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's a great pleasure. And uh, for those of you who actually were at the uh, joint math meetings in 2019, I have to apologize that a lot of what I'm going to say was part of my second lecture of the lecture series there. But, uh, uh, well, I may, maybe I'll have a few jokes that you haven't heard. Um, so, it's what I'm going to talk about has to do with what uh, what what old fashioned machine learning. I mean, uh, these days when people say machine learning, they think of uh, neural nets, and it's not that I'm against neural nets. Uh, in fact, I have with 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 in collaborations uh, used neural nets. I also am uh, of the of the conviction of virtually every mathematician and other scientists I know that we don't really know what's going on in neural nets and that there's a lot of work to do there. But this talk will not be about neural nets and will not use them. So uh, what am I talking about? So, uh, well, if you get data which have structure in them, then in some cases uh, you have good reason to presume that the parameter dependence of the data makes turns them into some kind of low dimensional manifold. But if the data are such for every data point, you have lots and lots and lots of variables, then uh, it can be hard to discover. I mean, if you have something like this uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, the, uh, in your data set, and uh, you have this two-dimensional manifold, it's kind of folded, but it lives in thousand dimensions. How are you going to find it? And uh, the method that I'll, I'll propose in, in, that I'll, I use in, in this presentation is uh, actually, I'm going to try to maybe leave full screen and go to presentation mode, because I think we'll then see, uh, 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 Presentation. Okay. Yes. Is it is this still working for all of you? Yes. This yes. Is bad. Okay. So um, what we will do is we'll uh, use uh, uh, diffusion maps. That's to say, we'll assume that uh, when we have data points that in this high dimensional uh, situation, that when other data points are very similar, that the manifold is. Uh, uh, smooth enough and that we have enough data that we are locally almost flat. 
so that we can approximate the situation well by looking at, uh, for instance, the tangent uh, plane in, 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 in that neighborhood. And um, what that means is that we have local geometry. And then, well, that still doesn't give you global geometry, but if you have the local geometry everywhere, then you can use that to hop from point to point and from there change chart and go to different and so on. And you can try to knit together them all. I mean, I like, uh, uh, so many people use lots of sports analogies. I am not so much into sports, but I'm lots into crafts. So I, my, uh, my, my, all my analogies are crafting. So I like this idea of knitting together and getting the geometry that way. And in fact, it's not different from thinking of these, these stupid little animals uh, all, all covered with sequins. Each little sequin is just really a disc. And the sequence follow that whole surface. And by seeing the collection of surface of sequence, you get an idea of the geometry of the skin of these, these stuffed animals. Okay, so uh, how does that work in, in, in mathematically? What happens is that you can look at paths in every one of these neighborhoods and look at random walkers. And then where you have overlaps, you can, as I said, change the, the chart. And as a result is that you will be able to define random walks on the whole uh, uh, surface, on the whole manifold, where clearly things are not flat anymore. And uh, you will then be able to talk about uh, uh, the, 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 the random walks are linked with Laplacian. So you'll get information about the spectrum and the eigenvectors of the Laplace Beltrami operator on the manifold. And that enables you to, so here you can see, you can do a long random walk and that enables you to then uh, say things about the geometry. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, well, if I have two data points, I and J, then I assume I have some similarity, some distance, so some dissimilarity rather than some similarity. And uh, as long as I am fairly flat, uh, so I can, as a first approximation, uh, a view, so as actually a second order approximation already, uh, uh, view as the tangent plane as 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 a good uh, 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 a good picture of what's going on. Then in 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 Euclidean spaces, we know how to write the uh, uh, diffusion operator. We just get one e to the minus distance squared uh, l two distance squared over two times the time, and we need a normalization there, of course, but uh, which we don't know because we don't know the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. But let's leave that in the middle for now. So I define this for Wij. It has the great benefit that if I define this similarity all over my data set, that when things are very dissimilar, the entry is going to be approximately zero because the e to the minus d squared over two tau, uh, the d squared is too large, and so it becomes zero. So um, how am I going to normalize? Well, we have to not only make up for the fact that we don't know the intrinsic dimension of that low dimensional manifold, but we also, uh, uh, since our data are just measurements, some points might have more neighbors than others. And we need to compensate for that because we're not truly building the uh, uh, Laplace Beltrami operator. We're building a discrete operator, which we hope will give us enough uh, properties of the true Laplace Beltrami operator that we can usefully extract geometric information from it. So we have to take into account that some points may have more neighbors than others. This is inevitable. So the way we do it is we just look at the, uh, uh, the local trace, so the sum of all the matrix elements uh, uh, for a given i, and we use that to normalize so that we get an up, uh, 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 something that at least on the graph will be a random walk. Namely, if you start, if you take this, this diffusion of matrix that you build and you apply it to the vector of all ones, it will reproduce all ones, which is what you expect the diffusion to do. So it is a stochastic matrix. Now, how to pick this tau? So if you think in terms of diffusion, then it's clear that you don't want to pick tau too small. Because if tau is too small, all you will get is the identity operator. Because all the other entries that are not on the diagonal will be too small and you get the identity operator. And so things don't diffuse. You're trying to, you, you blink and nothing gets the time to diffuse over the distances that you have in your data set. So you want to take tau reasonably large, but you can't take tau too large because you do want to have this notion that only local 
flat on the sequin we are diffusing, but not away because the distance that we infer or measure or compute or whatever between points that are far away is certain not to be the true geodesic or, or uh, and, and in any case, for even for geodesic, for the true geodesic distance, the matrix would not be computed this way. We're really using the fact that locally we are flat to make this approximation. But you know that uh, uh, if we had a true diffusion, then it would do the semi-group property. If you diffuse for time t, and then you diffuse for a time s uh, more, then you will have diffused for time t plus s in total. So you can check that the diffusion matrix that you build, and which should be an approximation of the diffusion operator, should satisfy that it obeys a, a, a semi-group property. So you can check that the matrix for tau corresponds, if you square it, corresponds about to the matrix for two tau. In fact, this was uh, an, 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 uh, 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 parada uh, uh, a solution to how to pick tau, pick tau uh, which, which is in the, the thesis of my uh, former student, uh, Shan Shan, who is uh, uh, who will is in tenure track job at uh, Mount Holyoke. Uh, uh, right now, she's on a leave working with collaborators in Denmark. Uh, so she's confined to an apartment in Denmark instead of in New England. But uh, um, now, what you can then do is. Uh, so we hope that we have, and if we have our data are sufficiently dense, one can prove that one has an approximation of the true Laplace Beltrami diffusion operator. And so you can look at the, the spectral decomposition of that diffusion. Now, of course, so we, we look at very small times. So that's only little local diffusion. I said, but we want to diffuse over longer distances. So in principle, you should look at powers of this matrix, given that we know we, ex we, 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 we it, it will behave like a, 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 a semi-group. But of course the eigenvectors and the eigenvalues, eigenvectors will be exactly the same whether you look at powers or the matrix itself. And so in order to do longer diffusion, all you do is you do the spectral decomposition for diffusion after a small tau, and then you take the eigenvalues and you take them to a higher power gamma in order to get the longer times. So what you can then do, and this is uh, in order to use that geometric insight that you got from this analysis, is to say, let's take the values of the eigenvectors, let's view the, this, this, this way of writing the matrix as a way of telling us a coordinate system, let's parameterize different points by looking at the different values of the eigenvectors weighed with some uh, uh, diffusion and look at that as a way of parameterizing in now an L2 space. What have you gained in all this? because you had a difficult parameterization, you have another difficult parameterization. Well, typically you can do a dimension reduction. So instead of the thousands of dimensions you had, you can uh, take much fewer, but the, uh, uh, that's one thing. But the, uh, uh, the other thing is that by somehow distilling geometry out of the whole construct of everything, and using that to define this parameter system, you kind of have denoised your data because your data are not truly on that manifold that you're trying to define. They're a little bit off all over. And so in, in, in trying to, 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 to put it in the, in the correct, what you, what you can prove would be the correct way of dealing with it if it were a manifold, you have taken away a lot of that, those fluctuations if they were not consistent with that picture. Okay. So examples, uh, this is a data set I will come back to. And for the moment, I'm just going to tell you uh, what uh, diffusion bought us for this. So this is a data set of uh, 50 uh, points in a very high dimension, uh, uh, which fall apart, well, which we know consists of five families of 10 more well, uh, related points. And uh, the left picture is what you get if you do multidimensional scaling from a distance that is re reasonably natural for this family set. 
and you see the colors correspond to the different uh, uh, classes that they don't really uh, uh, cluster. They cluster somewhat, but not that well. The same data, so the same distances that were used for the multidimensional scaling were used instead for a diffusion picture. And then if you then use the, and, and you, you, the, 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 uh, the approach I, I just sketched and look at where the points fall in the best three-dimensional approximation of, of, because I want to make a picture of, of, the, uh, of, of that data set, you see that already the points of similar nature get much closer to each other. So I've explained to you how the diffusion distance works. We take these eigenvalues, we take them from the approximate power, and we look at that. Uh, how to tell you more about the data set we talk about, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, let me tell you about the collaboration in which this all grew. It it's all started with a conversation that I had about 12 years ago with Yuka Jernval, who is a, uh, a Finnish, uh, uh, physical anthropologist, and he works, his tool is uh, biological morphology. That's to say, uh, they, he is interested in evolution, of course, and in, in, in how things, how animals change. And of course, we know that that is governed by what happens in the genome, and we can make these beautiful phylogenetic trees based on, on genomic differences. But ultimately, the way evolution is, is not the mechanism of evolution, but how it's steered is by interaction of the bio, of the organism with the environment. And uh, so that doesn't act directly on the genes, it acts on the organism. So you still uh, need to look at shape of organisms and bones and, and so on. So that's what they look at, the morphology. And they look at both living and extinct animals. Doug Boyer was then his postdoc. And he's now, by happenstance, he's become a, a, a professor at Duke. So we find ourselves at the same place, which is very convenient for working together. So the way it worked is that Yuka Jernval, oh, yes, let me talk about other collaborators. So all the results I'm going to talk about come from collaborating not only with Doug and Yuka, but also students. Rima is now in Zurich. Ting Ran uh, was at Chicago. He's still at Chicago, but he's no longer at the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, he works in, in uh, um, uh, private industry, in private uh, company now. Uh, Rob Revere is at Duke, but is going to leave soon for the next stage of his career. Jesus was at the University of Mexico, but left for Morgan. Uh, Roy is at, at uh, ETH Zurich. Jan Lipman was my postdoc when we first started in Princeton and uh, uh, went, is now at a professor at Weizmann. Shahar Kowalski is a professor at UNC. Shan Shan, I described already earlier. Uh, Chen Yun Lin is at um, University College in New York. Nadav will soon go, is at Duke and will soon go to, uh, uh, to the Technion in Israel. So people from all over and, and working on many different things. So Chan Chan, I've also worked on paintings and actually this is an allusion on that work where she put the same, took the same pose as a pose on a portrait that she liked very much in the museum. But, uh, okay, so what was this project with, with, with uh, Yuka and Doug? So Yuka told me that they had um, had a, a a very interesting paper uh, that was published in Nature, in which they could show that based on that they could very well classify the diet of different mammals based on the complexity of their teeth. And the classification is very detailed. So it's not just herbivores versus carnivores. It is in carnivores, uh, are they eating insects? Are they eating reptiles? Are they eating warm-blooded animals? In, in, in uh, herbivores, are they eating fruits? Are they eating leaves? Are they eating seeds? I mean, so very detailed classification. And they were very excited because it worked regardless of scale. I mean, it worked on shrews, which are very tiny little insect eaters, and it worked on elephants. Uh, it, uh, and it was so consistent on all the animals they tried it on that uh, it was very reasonable to infer diet in the past uh, based on the complexity, which meant that they now had a tool to give them an indication for ex 
extinct animals for which they don't have remnants anymore in their stomachs because there are no stomachs preserved of what they ate. So, and he said, uh, because you're a mathematician, it might be of interest to you that complexity of, of geometry. I said, well, how do you measure it? And the way they measured it was actually, so we're talking now in, in, the, the, in the aughts. So, so we're talking about 15, 16 years ago. Um, in, in computer graphics at that time, in order to really visualize on a screen a surface very well, they would make a computation in which they would put three lights in vir virtually, a red, a blue, and a white light. And these would shine back in different uh, degrees from the reflecting surfaces. And those different shades of blue, red, and white turned out to be very well adapted for the two-dimensional view of it, especially if you made it turn a little bit, uh, to re be reconstructed as 3D information in our brain. So they had realized that if they then took snapshots of that and they looked at finely discretized, uh, so they, the surfaces they had were finely discretized, triangulated, and looked at snapshots, then every one of those triangles, if they zoomed in, had a little color, I mean, a little bit more blue, a little bit more red, and so on. And if they looked at changes of colors integrated over the whole surface, summed over the whole surface, over the whole snapshot, to the snapshot, that gave them an idea of how much different in angles there was between all these different triangles. And uh, they use that to measure complexity. I said, so you really are looking at how the normal to the surface changes as you go from, oh, uh, as you integrate over the surface. And he says, yes. I said, well, that is something, that's a concept that we know in mathematics. It's uh, the Dirichlet energy. I mean, you, you can compute it. Uh, there exist computer graphics algorithms to, to, to do this. And so that's how we started working on this. So Yaron uh, was delighted actually to do something for which his mathematics and his uh, computational techniques would uh, work and help science rather than uh, the design of video games. And uh, which is what the computer graphics is usually the, 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 the source of. And uh, that's how we started. But then when they saw we could help with that, they came with a much more complex question. And that's often how I found interdisciplinary projects to take off. You, the first thing you do is usually not so world shattering, but it makes it possible for the people you interact with to see what it is that you do think about and what it is that does not suit you and so on. And so then things can get formulated and that's the interesting stage. So, um, they asked us to whether we could find ways of defining distances between surfaces without landmarks. So we first, they first had to explain a little bit. So let me give you a, a, an example of, of one of these teeth. So the way they acquire the teeth is by micro CT scanning. And people immediately and say, well, why do you only look at the surfaces with micro CT? You get volume information. Yes. But for many of us, since they work both on existing and uh, elements and fossils, they, they work a lot with uh, uh, samples uh, with teeth of, that are very rare and that you can't just borrow from whoever has it. Uh, however, uh, Doug has made it his specialty in the in many many years, and so he has thousands and thousands of them now. Whenever he goes somewhere, he takes scans of their local fossils and collection of teeth, and so he comes back with these very detailed resin scan, uh, not scans, uh, casts, very detailed resin casts of all these teeth, and so those he can then scan. But you have, of course, although you have a volume uh, uh, object the only true information that you have there is the surface of, of the cast. I mean, we don't have the 3D information on the teeth. So that's why we extract surfaces. So surfaces are again then extracted by means of uh, uh, standard uh, techniques and uh, uh, rendered. And in order to then map them to each other, we often uh, make that visual by putting textures on them. Okay, so those are the data. And uh, how do on these data do uh, how how do they define similarities typically? 
Uh, well, typically they have a collection that they want to study. They want to study some features, uh, changes of features as the climate changed or, and then or as, 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 as the animal uh, in evolution became bigger and so on. So, so they have a whole collection and of course they're experts on this. And so they know these different features on the teeth, what they mean functionally and so on. And so they put a number of landmarks they look at the collection and they find features that exist on all the teeth that are corresponding holonomous and uh, they put landmarks on each and the same number on all of them and you then think you can find the coordinates for these landmarks and you use those triplets for the landmarks as a proxy for the shape and here is a, a, a collection of different teeth with all their landmarks placed on it. And you see sometimes some landmarks are far apart, this blue and the, the black one here, and closer on another tooth. So, I mean, the, the, the change in geometry is captured to some extent by those landmarks. And then to define the distance between two, two, uh, uh, two okay, so, because it's land uh, placement uh, dependent on landmarks, I'm going to tell you the distance in a little bit. Uh, uh, there are shortcomings, and that's why they wanted to avoid going to landmarks. First of all, it's tedious and time consuming. So what typically happens is that uh, uh, researchers who work on this train undergrads in, in, in doing this and then, then pay the, the work study uh, uh, rate in order to place landmarks uh, with, I mean, it's not as accurate as if they did it themselves, but I mean, it's it's time consuming and your eyes glaze over after a while. And, and uh, um, there's also lack of flexibility. Uh, you might have a very rare tooth that's missing a piece. What that means is that you cannot take into account in your study, anything that happened to that missing piece on the other teeth in your collection. I mean, you just, there's nothing uh, you can put there. You can put no landmarks. Um, of course, you need a high degree of knowledge. And, and if you don't have that expertise, then you can't put landmarks uh, reliably. And more and more people like to put their data sets online. And if you can't landmark the data set, if it's online, then it's useless for you. You can't make these distances. And sometimes people disagree, even among experts. So how do they make a distance? So uh, the progressive distance, if you have all these landmarks for different teeth, is you uh, uh, take for the corresponding landmarks, you have, uh, so here XJ stands for the, uh, the three coordinates for the J's specimen. I'm sorry, I was X, Y, Z before, but now X, J is the spatial coordinates for the J specimen. And Y, J is the, J, the, the, three, the, the, the coordinates for uh, 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 a different landmark. Uh, so for one landmark, and this is for, a different, for uh, the same landmark, but on a different tooth. So I have one tooth and another tooth, and I have the same landmark, the light green landmark, for instance, and I look at their coordinates. Now, because they were put in different positions in space, their coordinates are going to be different. So what I do is I move one coordinates, uh, one, one uh, virtually. I imagine moving one so that it's as closely uh, uh, put in position to the next one, and I rotate it so that some of the coordinates are as, as, as a sum of coordinate different squares is as small as possible. And then that minimum, I call the progressive distance. So what I said is, this is what we use. Can you, and that was their question to us 12 years ago, can you find a distance that does as well as the progressive distance without having to put landmarks? I said, okay. Uh, plenty of distances that people use. And I said, but does as well uh, automatically, so without in human intervention, and for biological purposes. So we had to define, I'll come back to that, what do we mean to be successful in for biological purposes? Okay, so a little bit more about data sets. So this is an example of one of the teeth we looked at. Uh, well, man, one of the many teeth we have studied. Uh, they consist of these tiny little triangles. 
So here I'm showing you, I think this was about 10,000 triangles. This is a mouse lemur T. So the animal itself is like a mouse. And uh, you can imagine how big its molars are. So that's why we go to micro CT. But so it's, 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 we know it in excruciating detail and typically we have to do a dimension reduction before we even can compute with those. And so what we did is we came up actually with two different distances. One, which I actually liked more than the other uh, mathematically, but the other one uh, gave us better results. So let me describe them to you slightly. Uh, the first is the conformal Wasserstein neighborhood distance. So if I have these two teeth, the first thing I'm going to do, because I have, these are surfaces with a rim, because we cut them off at, 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 at where the enamel finishes. Uh, uh, these can be flattened. I mean, just like an orange peel, you can flatten that, but you don't, you're not allowed to tear it, which is hard with an orange peel, but you can actually, if you, if you, you can imagine shrinking it in some places and not in other places. And that's exactly what you do in order to flatten conformally. And so we do that uh, not because we believe that uh, uh, biological uh, uh, processes are conformal, because there's no reason why they would be. It's just that it makes it easier for us to study uh, uh, two-dimensional objects, because we have to do a lot of searching, than three-dimensionals. That's all. It's computational efficiency. The geometry gets is translated in how much you need to shrink or expand locally in order to manage to make it flat. And so that's a function on that disk, a, a kind of geometric landscape, the conformal factor. And then we need to find, if you have two points in there, how similar they are. So uh, I drew it here. Uh, it should have been really little circles that take little hyperbolic neighborhoods on the disk of these two points. I can move them by uh, 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 a conformal mapping to the center. And I can look at locally how similar are these two landscapes. And that you then use that in what's called a uh, an, uh, an optimal transport network, an optimal transport paradigm in order to find a similarity between uh, uh, the surfaces. So the details of this uh, are a bit technical, but the main thing is that you look at the whole geometry, you compare any two points on the two surfaces by looking locally at how similar their geometry are, and then you find the best possible way of aligning these pictures of the geometry by integrate by, by looking at infimum over all possible ways of doing that correspondence. Okay. In the continuous progressive distance, which we defined mathematically as well, you first, I'll come back to the area preserving later, but the first idea is that you have, because we have no landmarks, we have to find a correspondence. So here, this blue curve and the, 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 the uh, orange ellipse, I've defined you a correspondence. And then once you have that correspondence, you can try to put the two in a position. You can rotate the blue curve so that the sum of the distance squared is small as possible. It's smaller in, in this middle configuration than the one at the left. But in fact, there exist correspondences for which you get even better. This correspondence, for instance, obviously is a much better one. The sum of the distances squared is even better. So how do I define my correspondences? So you see, I start, started with a correspondence and then I rotate and I then take the minimal correspondence. So I have these two infima. So I need to know an infimum over something. So I need to look at a class in which I have my correspondences. So we defined it to be the area preserving the pheomorphisms, not because we believe that, again, uh, the area is preserved in, in, in biological evolution. It isn't. Uh, but because, remember, we're going to use all this in diffusion distances. So only the things will matter where diffusion distances, where the distance is very small. So we only need to get it accurate for things that are very similar. And if things are very similar, 
then it's not such a big uh, uh, stretch to assume that we're almost area preserved. And we had to define some class because we wanted to do something mathematical. So we could prove beautiful theorems about this, this, this distance. It also, so that's how we define the continuous progressive distance. It's again, because this notion of minimizing over rigid transformations. So that's similar to progressives. And here, for instance, you see the correspondence between two quite different teeth visualized by putting a texture on one of them and then seeing how it gets transformed to the other tooth. And you see this, this cusp gets a cusp again, becomes a blue cusp, this, this green cusp becomes a green, this was a purple one, it becomes a purple. Uh, here we're not doing as well. I mean, clearly, uh, this, this is... Well, it's it's arguable whether these three cusps are doing properly here. We're a little bit off for this one. Any case, so this was our first map, and we called it CP for continuous procrustes. And this is the one that I showed you in, uh, so yeah, how, how good were they? Well, we had defined ahead of time how we would measure success. So one thing was to say, let's take a whole lot of things, and we took very different uh, samples, and let's look at distances. And so here, blue is very, very small, white is in the middle, and red is towards the large range. We ordered them, we labeled them so that things were more similar if they had numbers that were close to each other. So what that means is that uh, uh, we expect similarity, especially near the diagonal. So it was because we want small distances to be accurate. We wanted to our distances that we determined to be close to the one that were given by the, 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 their traditional methods uh, near the diagonal. And so for the two different methods that we proposed, two different distances, we look here at low ups near the diagonal. And you see here that the continuous progressive distance really does better. I mean, this is more symmetric picture where we compare our way of doing and the observer uh, uh, landmark placement, uh, I forget what the D stand, observer determined landmark placement distance. Uh, this picture is more symmetric in, in for the, the continuous progressives and for the other case. So those were the distances that the biologists pre pre uh, preferred. And the biolog we, we also looked at how did our mappings move landmarks and the landmarks are not that different from the cases where uh, 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 observers put them. And we did it not just for teeth, but also for other bones. Uh, and as I said, we bypassed explicit uh, feature extraction. And um, this is the clustering we got for continuous procrustes distances. Four, and now I can tell you what the sample is. Here we were looking at a sample of um, 10 different genuses, gen genera of uh, 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 Lemurians. And uh, we had uh, 10 species per genus. So we have a total of 50, where within each color, things are supposed to be more similar than between colors. And Biologists weren't really understanding why I kept saying we want the small distances to be accurate until we show them that if you apply diffusion distances, the diffusion uh, paradigm to those uh, continuous progressive distances, you make your uh, uh, clustering so much better. I mean, so we didn't use any other measurements. We used all the numbers that we got out of the continuous progressives but then processing him with diffusion uh, uh, apparatus gave us, gave us this. And then in the thesis of Tingran, and that's what I want to talk about in the next chapter of this talk, he found that uh, Tingran Gao, that you could do much better even. In fact, when the biologist said this, oh my God, look at it. Uh, the, the insectivores are all apart. I mean, maybe we are seeing uh, uh, evolution uh, at work here. And, in fact, it turns out you don't because, uh, but I, I, I think I'll come back to that. What happened is that, uh, well, I can tell you now. What happened is that in fact, these blue and the purple ones are not the most closely related. 
or the, the green and the, the, the red ones are not the most closely related. But it turns out they eat the same. So since we're looking at molars, we are looking at convergent evolution. We're seeing that uh, things that eat leaves have teeth that look much more like each other and things that fr eat fruit are much more like each other and insectivores indeed are apart. Okay, but so what was this new thing that Ting Ran introduced? Well, as I showed you for diffusion distances, you introduce the local stuff and you knit together to get the spectral parametrization and distance in, in, in a, 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 a geometric, a, a distance that you hope is closer to the uh, geodesic distance on, on the underlying manifold. So what we had were our teeth and we had distances, but we had much more. We had these mappings between the teeth. And when you look at it this way, you realize that every point on this underlying manifold of species, so every species is a point, is in fact not just a manifold of species, because we do, we characterize them by means of their, in this case, teeth, but you could have other bones. So every point has structure to it. So you have really a fiber bundle. You have an underlying manifold, and at every point, you have a fiber. And you have mappings between these fibers. And our fiber bundle is, so I'm thinking of each of these fibers as a tooth, a two-dimensional fiber. But they're very, very nonlinear. I mean, most fiber bundles that people have studied in detail and of which they have beautiful properties and, 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 and Hodge complexes and so on are uh, either linear spaces or uh, uh, constant norm subsets, the, 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 the unit ball in a, in, in, in a space or so on. And you inherit a lot from the linearity of those spaces. That's not the case for us. So we have a very nonlinear fiber bundle, but it's still a fiber bundle. And we have connections. I mean, mappings between the fiber. That's what a connection is called. What, that's what's called a connection. And so what uh, Ting Ran Gao did was he used these, he used the fact that you had this construction to get a much more detailed uh, uh, idea of diffusion on the high dimensional object, which is a manifold itself. And get out the, uh, uh, the low dimensional one later. So what's a fiber bundle? A fiber bundle is, is, well, you have the total manifold in which every point in your fiber bundle, you have a point where it's sitting on the base manifold, and then you have to tell it where you're sitting on the fiber. So uh, you have the, the, the total thing, the manifold and the fibers. And then you have a way of getting from the total thing to, so it's like like going down. It's imagining if you imagine uh, uh, the the Earth at the Earth and then the whole atmosphere, and you imagine zooming down uh, on the vertical back to the point on the Earth's surface. I mean that's the projection. Okay, so everybody, I mean people who've looked at these things know that uh, uh, you you uh, if if you that, that knowing the, the base manifold and just the fiber itself can live, lead you to different uh, fiber bundles. I mean, these two fiber bundles are very different, uh, that both are on the circle and the fibers are line segments. And um, here are examples of other fiber bundles that people have looked at, tangential fiber bundles, uh, the, 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 the unit tangential fiber bundle, this is yet something else. Uh, Ours are, I mean, we, we, we look at it like that, a fiber bundle, and we have our, our, our uh, connection. And we, what we hope to build, what we can build nicely is diffusion on our, within each tooth, because we can build Laplace Beltrami. We can use our mappings to go between teeth and we can diffuse a little bit here we can do all that and uh, try to extract what we want to get is this construction here, this, this geometry here. We can build this blue geometry, 
up to a certain point and not just blue horizontally but also we, we we go off a little bit and we can so we can build a diffusion on the fiber bundle and so we can build that enormous so the fiber bundle is huge because you have as all the teeth that you have and on every tooth hundreds of points so you now have an enormous thing you can look at the diffusion on there and you can look at the eigenfunctions and eigenvectors just like before and the fusion vectors will have points that correspond to each of the different teeth. Note that we don't need the same number of points on each tooth anymore. Once we have defined a good way of mapping things, we can deal with that. And you can then look at what have you learned. Interestingly, if you just look at the top three non-trivial eigenvectors and you characterize your surfaces in, in, in those three, then you get a common template. That's to say, since I'm in three dimensions, every point on my each tooth becomes a point in three dimensions. So all the points that correspond to this tooth give me this red thing, to this tooth, the green, and so on. And together in R3, they are nicely sitting on one surface or near one surface. So it is an indication that we found a common template, which is nice. That's the fiber. We have the same fiber and we have, uh, now we have a way of improving our, our registration. Because of course, when you discretize your different teeth, there's nothing that guarantees, in fact, everything guarantees that you will not have that the point you pick on the red tooth is exactly the equivalent of the point you pick on the green tooth. You're never going to be on top of that. But we can now see that. We map them to the template and we say, oh, this red point lands in between these three green points. Let's just take in that triangle the barycentric coordinates. And then we know to what green point our red point would really go. Not to one of those greens, but somewhere in the middle. And we can we know which one. And so we actually, this way of making our mapping much better is really cleaning up i mean so much so that the cp which used to be stand for cont uh, a continuous progressive distance we now uh, take it also as the abbreviation for the crappy distances i mean uh, because we make them so much better we get so much better maps um you could in order to see whether biologically you got something is what we did here is we tried in the high dimensional space using more than the first three i don't know how many uh, uh do a clustering into into regions and here i believe they clustered into 13 regions and it was really interesting that some of those regions are uh so we just colored them on the tooth very interesting already is that every color is represented on each tooth we didn't ask for that it just asked for 13 clusters in this high dimensional space. Um, and so we have now corresponding things. And some places, the region is much smaller than in others. So uh, for instance, you have this tiny little uh, uh, green region here. And here, it's a much bigger one. This is something that the biologists really liked and immediately started exploiting. We, would, we had to tell them, hold your horses. We're going to do better. They said, we don't care. This is already very good. We can use it to do things we couldn't do before. Um, you can also use this to get a better idea of the base manifold, because what you can do is say, look, this whole collection of red points gives me an idea, gives me a little, a little gram matrix, because of course the whole, these things are orthogonal with each other. But once you look at, in, at, 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 at uh, the, the one tooth by itself, these pieces of it need not be. And you can do that everywhere. And you can use that in order to extract, uh, to project to the geometry on the base manifold. So, because each of them is a copy of what's going on spectrally on the base manifold. Okay, so, and that's how thing run went from diffusion distances to this much better. And as I said, you had that the clustering is not one of, 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 of things that are close related because the purple and the blue are the furthest apart phylogenetically, but they're both frugivores. And the green and the red are folivores and Okay, 
now we believe, and this is a paper that we're in the process of writing, that uh, this is really something that applies much more widely, much more than just to these teeth. Because in very many cases, when people do diffusion methods, they compare things that are similar, but how do they get the similarity? They say this, these two are more similar than they are to that because there's internal structure. And these structures are more, but if you have structure, then you have some type of fiber. So let's look at it. These are examples of the NIST database of 100 digits. And here are examples, and you can try again again. And actually many methods that compare these define little mappings. I mean, so let's define mappings. And you can map between things that are not of the same class. I mean, it's not a great mapping, but you can. And so you can define something similar to the progressive distance, and you can do everything else. And here, just to show you results, on the left are things that are defined just by using diffusion, separating a certain number of ones from a certain number of sixes by diffusion distance. And this is the same ones, but with uh, the diffusion distance projected from the big. Uh, uh, and you see, you have a cleaner separation. This is, again, another group of ones and sixes, and again, a cleaner separation. Here we look at many digits together. And uh, again, uh, the, the, the separation, it's not as clean anymore. We have four digits, uh, but it is cleaner after than before we took into account the mappings in order to define this projection. In a sense, what we've done is we have used much more information and used that to get rid of some of the deviations that we still have to do a further denoising. So a lot of times when you have data, by using the correct mathematical model to make things fit, you if it's the correct model, then it will take away a lot of the noise that is counteracting that interpretation. Now, where do we want to go? We want to go much further. I mean, and this is the stage on which, on, 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 uh, see here on the left are teeth that are primate molars, and you can see that there's an air of familiarity among them. And so we've been working on collections like these. But ultimately, you want to compare teeth of all mammals in this application, or you want to, in other settings, look at, at data that are more different. This is what these are called crab eater seals, even though they don't eat crabs, they eat uh, uh, krill. Uh, they use these, these extuberances in their teeth as a sieve to, to, to pull up, push out the water with their tongue, and then all the little uh, nutritious bits uh, remain behind and they eat them. You're not going to find nice mappings from teeth from primates to those. So what I believe is that the phylogenetic tree will be a model for us to, in our fibers, clump some points together that in that branch uh, show more detail, but that don't uh, transform to, to branches that are more, more remote. So I think we'll have a kind of multi-scale way of having to analyze these manifolds, but that's for the moment, pure science fiction. And I think that's the end of my talk. So I'll stop sharing. All right, thank you very much Ingrid for this really, really amazing talk. It's very, very inspiring. So are there any questions from the audience for, for Ingrid? Mm -hmm. There a really simple one. Hands. Just, so uh, why don't you steer it because? Uh, Yes. Oh, Robert, please. Anyway, it's Rob, Rob Kessler. Hey, um, just, you know, in the, in the fiber bundle model, if, if you took, for example, just the simplest sort of interesting fiber bundle, maybe a uh, three sphere with a hop vibration, is there, is there, in that case, do you, do you, you know, you, the, the two sphere there sort of sits more as a quotient than as a sub manifold of the three yeah. sphere. You, so what, what do you see? Could you, is there, is there a, a, a some some project where you actually sort of recognize the uh, the base it's, base there. I'm just wondering what what it would look like. That's the, the simplest example I could think of. Where I was wondering what you actually would do. And and because um, there's this whole that bundle has has bundle curvature also. So it's 
It's yeah. an interesting phenomenon that's happening. And absolutely. And so it is definitely something that we want to do and we haven't done yet. And uh, so we, 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 because that is uh, the, the, the simplest one we can think of, we, which has that, that, that bundle curvature, uh, we want to see how, 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 how that would work out. But uh, because for the moment we are actually relying these biological things Provided that you, that you clump together, that we do the multi-resolution, or if if at the level where we are now that you have closely related species, these are completely trivial bundles because they're completely trivial because they do believe that the connections will commute. I mean, meaning if you go from A to B and B to C, it should give you would go from A to C because we look at things that have a common ancestor, and going from A to B is the same as going to ancestor D and then back from D to B. And because you expect a common ancestor, uh, you expect that the, the the that commutativity, which means that you have uh, no no curvature to the, the 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 connection. I mean, which in 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 these more interesting fiber bundles, uh, you, you do expect. And in fact, when I talk to people who 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 work on on these things, they say, "Oh, they're all trivial." I mean, so poof, we don't care. Um, sure. But I mean, well, first of all, there's a reason why they're trivial. But uh, we believe also that once you look at, at species that are further removed, they will not be trivial. But we will be looking again, because of biology, to ways of, of, of course, graining them to get back to triviality. So it will be different from what happens in, in, in uh, for instance, the, the, the hop vibration of the three sphere, the two sphere. Uh, but we do want to, to understand what 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 this whole approach would do there as well, of course, because we are mathematicians, but we haven't done it yet. Sounds good. Look forward to it. Uh -huh. Mina, please. Hi. Um, one of the nice things about the classic Procrustes distance is that uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, one unique minimum. Yes. Right, and I'm wondering if there are if if your theory gives unique minima for any of these other distances, and if not, are local minima a problem? Uh, okay, so uh, we for the uh, continuous procrustes distance, uh, we um, we have no reason to assume that there's a, a minimum, but we have uh, in practice, we, we, we observe a unique minimum. Uh, well, you see, okay, there are two minimizations. In the, in the standard procrustes distance, you take only one minimum because you already know the corresponding points. You are given these points are the corresponding pairs, and then you look at the minimum for the rigid transformation. So that, of course, that we have that same minimum for the rigid transformation, and you find it very easily. Uh, but then we, because we don't know the correspondence, we have to also look at the class of all these correspondences and take a minimum there. And that's where you don't, you're not guaranteed that there's a unique minimum. Uh, in practice, all these cases where you worry about does there exist a unique minimum or not, in practice, typically there is a unique minimum. It's just the problem is not convex. I mean, you might have, a, a symmetry may cause you to have non-unique minimum but if there's degeneracy, but otherwise, but the problem is really that it's not convex. And so you have, you can get trapped in a local minimum because you're not, uh, so we do use uh, 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 intuitively ad hoc heuristic approaches in order to get close to what we believe will give the global minimum and then uh, minimize. Uh, also there exist beautiful methods um, developed uh, by, by Nadav, actually, Nadav Dim, who is going to Technion, uh, to use uh, uh, what he calls quasi-branch and bound to find uh, global minimizers, if, even for non-convex problems. Uh, paradoxically, using the fact that if you're near a, 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 a minimum, you uh, you have a certain kind of, 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 of behavior that you will not get elsewhere. And so you can exclude whole regions uh, because, because your, your gradient is still too steep and in, in, in essence. And uh, so that doesn't exclude local minima, but still it, it helps to make the problem more manageable and then you can search. If you have an exhaustive method that's manageable, you mm -hmm. can find a global minimum. And so that's what his method helps us do. Um, so 
Um, but the, 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 the practical thing is, of course, that, uh, I mean, we, we have thought of trying to do other approaches to, to constrain the minimizer. Uh, to 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 not to be area preserving, to just be have mm. some reasonable continuity and and some reasonable and so uh, so to to take a more variational approach. Uh, we haven't done that yet either. But, uh, Great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, there was also a question from Patrick, saying that uh, can this type of method be applied to uh, non-Euclidean distance setting, for example, when the data are sequences of words? So we actually have thought, I mean, we, we have talked with people in, in natural languages and so on to see, and I believe, uh, well, there are two aspects to this question. First, first of all, I believe that it should be possible to do something. I believe that when you have structure, you should exploit the structure before you try to extract the geometry on the base collection. Uh, you should not give up the mappings that you have if you have mappings. Um, so you should keep that going as long as you can uh, before uh, trying to find diffusion distances. Um, but I don't really know how to deal with these, these things of natural language. So that's, so I, that's, I, Another approach would be to say, look, um, there are people who are trying to get all the insights we have in geometry and make them purely discrete. So there are people who are trying to do harmonic analysis and uh, purely on discrete sets and trying to see how much of harmonic analysis of these beautiful scaling arguments and so on that we have can be used in a world where everything is discrete. I mean, how do you mean? Epsilon go to zero is not going to zero. So, um, and so in, in that setting, maybe all this can be interpreted as well, but it's too far from what I know of for me to say anything intellig intelligible about it. Uh, but I believe that's a possible direction in which one can go as well. But I do expect that one way or the other, this will be useful for uh, comparing texts. Thank you. Any other questions? I will stop the recording.